At this time of year, when the time for harvest is close at hand, we turn to God in gratitude. God has given us so many gifts, and the question is, what have we done with them? Let us praise God for all our gifts and the opportunities for service that they represent. Let us praise God for all the blessings of our lives, this day and every day. Let us worship God with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Generous God, in abundance you give us things both spiritual and physical. Help us to hold lightly the fading things of this earth and grasp tightly the lasting things of your kingdom, so that what we are and do and say may be our gifts to you. Therefore, with our hearts lifted high, we offer you thanks and praise at all times through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
to all to this virtual service. It is good to be able to gather together. Um, if you are new or just uh, coming to Central virtually for the first time, uh, we will have an opportunity for new members to learn more about the church and what it means to become a member and to make that commitment. And those meetings will happen the end of January and the beginning of February, and we'd love to welcome you. So please be in touch. Call the church office, 331-1960. Just a reminder that we are receiving um, food donations for Thanksgiving baskets um, for those in need at Camp Street Ministries. Um, the information is available on the website. Uh, we will be offering just virtual, virtual only services for the rest of November next week and then the 29th also. So we will see what the governor's guidelines are for the future after that, but just a reminder that we will be virtual only for the next two Sundays, the 22nd and the 29th. We will be having our annual cleanup day on Saturday the 21st before Thanksgiving Festival Sunday. Um, it'll be virtual, outdoors, um, and socially distanced. Lots of jobs for you to do to spruce up the buildings and grounds. Next week, of course, is our festival Thanksgiving service on the 22nd. Wonderful time to let a friend know about this possibility, and they can tune in also. And at, on that Sunday, it's the typical time that we receive the Neighbors in Need offering, and you'll receive more information about that. Um, you can give through Tithely with a note saying, it is for Neighbors in Need, the UCC national offering for those in need in our country. Or you can send or drop off a check to the church office with a note saying that it is for Neighbors in Need. On Tuesday the 24th, we will be joining in an interfaith virtual Thanksgiving service at 7 in the evening. Details will be on the website as soon as they're available. It's hosted by St. Martin's Church, so it is a good time to gather together with our friends from Temple Bethel, Temple Emmanuel, First Baptist Church, uh, and of course St. Martin's. So that's 7 o'clock on Tuesday the 24th. And next year, the great news is that Central will host this community-wide service. It's a wonderful time to gather together people of all faiths in our shared Thanksgiving. Let us now continue our worship. God gazes at us with mercy and love, waiting to forgive us, even as we hesitate to speak of the brokenness of our hearts. Together, let us offer our prayer of confession. Gracious God, we confess that at times we struggle to be faithful disciples. Forgive us when we have hidden the things you have given us, rather than lifting them up and wisely sharing them. Forgive us when we neglect to invest your gifts for the good of all your people. Have mercy on us, O God. Open our eyes to your realm that is already here, so that we might proclaim that your generous day of hope and grace has already come. In Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. God's giving knows no end. This is the great good news. God wants us to embrace life, to live in hope, to love one another, and when we fall short, to receive forgiveness through God's grace. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Amen. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I've made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I've made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. 
I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent uh, from him and give it to one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. May God bless this reading to our hearing and understanding. No doubt about it, this is a tough scripture. It seems so unfair. Why do some servants receive more and some less? And why in the world does the third servant get so severely judged when burying gold coins was a common practice of the day? Being called useless, cast into outer darkness, with wailing and gnashing of teeth, most of us are a little put off by this. We would like things to be fair and clear. I have puzzled a lot over this reading over the past week, and I've read a lot of commentaries to which I'm indebted for some different perspectives. I'd like to acknowledge now how helpful these perspectives have been for me in putting together this sermon. Could it be that it's just so much easier for us to see God as all gracious, giving and forgiving? rather than to believe that God has enough faith in us to hold us accountable. After all, the master could have said to the first two servants, oh, thanks, you did a good job. And to the third, you did nothing, you deserve nothing, you'll never amount to anything, and let it go at that. Could it be that the point of this parable is to recognize and appreciate God's gifts and to live lives as responsible recipients of God's gifts, to ask ourselves over and over, what have I done with what I've been given? Could it be that that servant buried his coin in the backyard because he was afraid? He believed his master to be a harsh man who reaped where he didn't sow and gathered where he hadn't planted any seeds. The servant knew this was life and death. So he got stuck as so many of us do, burying the coin, his talent. It was safe, so he felt secure. It was the custom in those days, too. But that was it. The other two were given everything, not just a little bit to test them. The master gave them a lot, and they did well with it. They got a lot of interest. So the sad part is not that the third fellow was afraid, because that can be a good thing, to have good fear and caution. But that he let fear take over his life. It kept him from moving forward. He just shrinks back into safety and doesn't dare to see what extraordinary things God can do with our ordinary lives. The truth is, though, life is not always fair or clear-cut for us. We don't know when the Master will return. All we can do is trust that he will. The first part of this parable is easy. You get rewarded when you take a risk, when you challenge yourself, and you accept responsibility. The second part, the judgment part, the not knowing part, that's just troubling, isn't it? So to recap, the boss is extremely generous. He gives the coins a huge amount of cash to the first two, and still a lot to the third about a year's worth of wages to him. So it's an exaggeration like that expensive jar of oil that was wiped on Jesus' feet. And then he leaves town. No instructions, no directions. Servants are left on their own. He comes back and he just asks, what have you done with what you've been given? We know the first two are praised. They invested well and there's interest even though you could argue they were irresponsible, careless, 
gambling. They got lucky, but it really wasn't their money to take big risks with. The poor third guy just hands back his coin, safe and sound. He knew the value of what he had been given, and he didn't want to blow it. Remember, he was scared. So he carefully wraps it up, probably feeling a little proud of himself, having guarded it well during the time that his master was away. And he hands the muddy sack of money over. And the master goes ballistic, doesn't seem to appreciate his servant's great moral strength, having been so careful. And he takes that coin away from the poor guy and gives it to the first one. Really seems a little overkill to me. What is this? To those who have more, will be, more will be given. To those who have, more will be given. What's wrong with playing it safe? We like God to be generous and gracious, giving us all those blessings of life and love and laughter, enough food to eat, Freedom for life, liberty, and happiness. Freedom to vote and opportunities to try to live our lives pretty much as we choose and to buy stuff, whatever we want or think we need. But having been given these good gifts, isn't, our, it, isn't it our responsibility to use them well? So that works for the first two servants. God praises them. How we want to be praised for living our lives well. But I'm still stuck with that third guy. So let's think about this way of understanding the parable, which I read this week, that shortly after sharing this story, Jesus was arrested and crucified. You don't get executed for handing out simple advice. Jesus offers something radical and challenging. Could it be that God doesn't seem to use people's abilities as did the first two servants who let their light shine. God doesn't use that quite as much, although God does use that, and we are taught to remember to let our light shine, which is a good thing. But maybe God also uses our flaws, our brokenness. Think of all the examples in our scriptures. Moses can't speak. Sarah thinks God is joking. Jonah bolts in the opposite direction. David was so small against Goliath. Peter has trouble ever really understanding Jesus. James and John are just plain jealous. So we might ask ourselves, what are my weaknesses? Where are you broken? And maybe that's just where the Spirit will use you. If this parable is to demonstrate Jesus sharing with us that such incredible gifts are offered to us, that we can't figure out what to do with them. Maybe we need to acknowledge this. A perspective on this holds that maybe what God needs is people who will connect together, shake their heads and confess, we just have no idea, this treasure is too big, too heavy. Maybe then, and only then, we can dare something extravagant for God. Maybe something small, but still very powerful like the widow's might, because her example, that small example of the tiny coin, it influenced others. The thing is, God gives the gospel not just to me or to you so that my strength or your gifts can be put to good use. God gives the good news to us so that our inability, our weaknesses, our fears and vulnerabilities might be exposed, and then we will find ways to work together using all of our gifts and talents. I close with one profound comment on this scripture. The gospel is too big for such trifles as using something that's easy for us, a gift we could even take for granted from God. Surely it is only to the dumbfounded, to the clueless, to the overwhelmed, to the fearful, to those who are under no illusion that they've ever known quite what to do because of Jesus, and they don't pretend it could ever be otherwise, to those people who keep asking the questions, those people which, dear friends, just might be us, the Master says, well done, good and faithful servant. 
May it be so. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, when we gather for worship, whether we are at home or away, alone or with family, wherever we are, may we take the time to reflect, to ponder all the gifts you've given us, some that we take for granted, some that we have hoped and prayed for, and some that have still not been answered. We count our blessings, God, and we realize how many there are. Today's scripture reminds us, though, that there's more you want from us. You want us to wrestle with your word. You expect us to struggle with how you would like us to live our lives. So we keep wondering, God, what sort of daring does Jesus have in mind? Not the reckless, thrill-seeking kind, but rather the wise, thoughtful kind, the kind of courage that looks at a situation and then, with hope and imagination, invests resources, money, yes, but also our time and our effort, our talent, our humor, and all the good things that you give us every day. You want us to invest these in ways that will multiply the goodness of the world. Remind us that your kingdom of heaven is coming. Indeed, it's dawning even now today in the middle of this pandemic. It's breaking into the world in and through our lives, our imagining, our actions, that one good thing can be two and then more. Help us to remember the gifts you've given us, God. Particular gifts, not someone else's. How can we help you put them to fruitful, courageous use? And we also dare to ask that you will use our weaknesses and turn them into strengths. What opportunities are near at hand? What good thing could we double or triple for that matter? And on the other hand, remind us of all the gifts that we've buried safely away because we were afraid of disappointing ourselves or others or you, our Lord. You urge us, God, to move from gratitude for these gifts that we've received into figuring out how to use them for others, how to share for your sake, how to live together with those who may be very different from us so that your kingdom comes ever closer to reality here on earth. We ask this and all things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have all freely received of God's many gifts. Let us freely give. Crossroads reminds us this year that our community has needed you like never before and you've risen to the challenge to help our neighbors who are facing unemployment and ho homelessness in record numbers. Because of you, vulnerable families have stable, secure housing. Parents are receiving educational and career support. Children are safe and healthy and have a safe place to complete their online learning. Cross Crossroads also reminds us that over 3,100 individuals needed the services of Crossroads in 2019. One of every four individuals who are homeless in Rhode Island are children. And it's three times more costly to support a family in shelter versus housing them. While Crossroads, with its mission of helping those who need a home, feeding those who are hungry, and reaching out to children living in homelessness or poverty, does its work year in and year out, this work is particularly urgent during these days of the pandemic. In addition to our financial support, we support Crossroads through our Sandwich Brigade every April and November. Each week during these months, donations of some 220 lunches of sandwiches, fruit, cookies, or snacks are available for those who would otherwise have no meal on a Sunday afternoon. 
Sadly, we've not been able to help those with these lunches because of the pandemic, but we are hopeful we'll be able to resume in April. Central has been a longtime partner with Crossroads, and, we're, and we hope to step up that partnership through our mission giving with the reimagining of Chapel Hall. Indeed, this mission giving component of our Chapel Hall campaign would provide much needed additional support to those served by Crossroads. We remain grateful for your generous support of all of our missions and for your continued support of Crossroads through the Sandwich Brigade. You are helping to make a real difference for those who struggle with housing, food insecurities, and other basic needs. Thank you. Gracious God, we thank you for all the gifts you have entrusted to us. Help us to remember that all we have comes from you and is to be used to serve you in so many different ways. Make us faithful and trustworthy servants, we pray, always ready to do your will. God of great gifts, you have given us so much. We ask that you accept and bless these gifts from our hands and our hearts this day as our faithful response to your abundant generosity. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's countenance be lifted upon you and be gracious to you. May God's face shine on you and give you peace this day and forevermore.